Product Marketing at Zerto. And today we're going to hear from Rich Coral at Wood Forest National Bank. And he's going to talk about the hurricane avoidance strategy that they use at Wood Forest. A um, couple of housekeeping things before we move on from the first slide. Um, one is in the panel that showed up on the right-hand side of my screen, you'll see a questions tab. So you can type in your questions, and we'll read those out loud at the end. If we do have the opportunity to take them throughout the slides, we will. But definitely at the end, we'll be reading those questions out loud and answering them verbally. So please feel free to ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions. And then secondly, the one thing I do like to point out before we move on from our first slide is our, our awards. So you can see we have several there. Um, the Best of Show at VMworld 2011, we actually got that award just two weeks after we GA'd the first version of our product. So what that really showed us is that there was a clear market need for this kind of technology. And since then, we've been able to add many awards. Okay, so here's our agenda. So first, um, we're, I'm going to turn over to Richard in just two slides. He's going to talk about Wood Forest National Bank and why they virtualized. He'll talk about his current approach for business continuity and disaster recovery and what the challenges were and then why they selected Zerto and what the BCDR process looks like with Zerto virtual replication. And then I'll take you through a couple of slides um, that showcase the features and benefits of Zerto virtual replication. So we have with us today Rich Coral. He is a solutions architect manager at Wood Forest National Bank, and he has a small team reporting to him. And he's responsible for the technical architecture of the data centers, virtualization, disaster recovery. Um, he's a VCP, two, three, and four, and five is in process. And he is a member of the VMUG out of Houston. And so Rich, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Um, I would say in 2005, I'll start out by saying in 2005, well, let me tell you about Woodforce Bank first. Uh, we've been in business 30 years. Um, you can see the bullets there. Uh, probably the key thing to Woodforce National Bank is that it has a niche in the retail banking locations uh, around the 17 states. And that means that we uh, are in places like Walmart, Scrubbers, and things like that, in you know, a retail space setting uh, where we offer a lot of our services. We do have traditional banks in uh, Texas, but uh, the retail banking is also in Texas, and it allows us to serve our customers 364 days of the year. We're only closed on uh, Christmas. And then we offer uh, extended hours uh, of the day. We actually have some 24-hour banks, so you can talk to a teller uh, at any time day or night. So, um, go ahead, uh, Jennifer. So in um, around 2005, we had uh, we decided that we wanted to get ourselves prepared in case we had a hurricane come through. We do uh, reside in Houston area, and that is always a threat. Um, we hadn't had one for a long time. I think the one before Ike was around 2019. 83. But uh, there's always a possibility. And so around 2005, we started to set up a secondary uh, data center at a remote location. And we put in some uh, hardware and software in order to uh, implement that. We chose an array-based uh, implementation. And uh, it was pretty complex. It had um, a Cisco SANTAP component, and it had uh, uh, array-based technology that was uh, allowed us to replicate uh, runs from one site to another in their entirety. Um, and with the virtualization that we did, uh, that really helped us. The more virtualization that we had, the better, easier it was to replicate that, uh, those work workloads. Um, we were about 50% uh, virtualized when we uh, implemented uh, in 2007, 2008 timeframe, and um, we really did see a, a reduce in cost for uh, assets and a lot more workloads on single, on a single platform. And 
Uh, today we're probably about 90%, 99% virtualized. The only things that we aren't virtualized in is uh, things that we've just decided that we, it's either uh, things that are, uh, we, the things that we have chosen not to virtualize. And those are a few things like uh, media agents for backups and things like that. Hey, Rich, um, some people are having a little trouble hearing you. I wonder if you could maybe move a little closer to okay. your mic. Does that help? I don't know if that... Let me see if that helps. Okay. Does that work? It, well, it, it sounded okay to me. I, don't, I think they might have a different kind of connection than I do, so um, why, don't we, why don't we keep going? Hopefully that, that has rectified the problem. Okay. I, well, I did move it closer, so we'll see if that helps. Uh, and you can go to the next slide, Jennifer. So currently we have two data centers, uh, and I'll try to speak a little bit about too. One in Austin and one in Houston. Uh, in June, uh, we proactively move our workloads from one data from our Houston data center over to Austin, and then uh, when we uh, when that hurricane season is well past, uh, we migrate those back to uh, Houston. And that avoids that whole window of hurricane season. Uh, it allows us to do that proactively, and we're not running around trying to get that done as we have a, if we have a threat coming into the area. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to move back and forth between data centers. Um, in the in the case that we're coming up up coming up against uh, in a few months where they're going to be putting in a water main, and so we'll probably be moving over earlier just in case uh, that might give us an interruption at our Houston location. Um, so our, our, as I mentioned earlier, we used uh, Cisco SANTAP, um, and the EMC Recover Point was our, our product of choice uh, for array-based replication, and that gave us an out-of-band solution. Um, that was uh, that was a good solution. It had uh, a lot of moving parts, and but it got the job done. And um, it took us about uh, eight to ten hours to move uh, our workloads from one site to the other, uh, and that included about two hours of a scripted preparation. So we would go through, run our script, make sure we had all of our uh, IP addresses collected that we were going to be changing via script, and when we, that would take a while to get all that straight, and then we would uh, prepare those uh, virtual machines and uh, we ship those across to the other site, and then we bring them up, up there. And then it took about six to eight hours after they were moved over to that site, uh, to the other site, for uh, mainly our um, VAs, our business analysts, to make sure that we had everything working per system, and they would say that they did, and, and we gave them quite a bit of uh, time to do that, but uh, they, once everybody was satisfied, we would reverse the replication and start running out of that other site with back up to the other site. So some of the challenges that we had with that was it was, it was complex. It had uh, Santap, the Cisco SANTAP piece, which was its, uh, it was embedded in the switch fabric switches. Uh, it had the recover point piece, which had an uh, administrative overhead that made sure that the uh, replication was uh, turned on and off and what direction it was going. And then we had uh, vCenter, which we used for uh, bringing up the workloads, uh, registering, deregistering, and setting up the um, making sure everything was running once it got up through that. Uh, and if we had issues with that, we had a failback process uh, that we would come back. But it was, uh, sometimes we had issues with one of the components and we'd have to stop or get that resolved before we could, could go forward. And um, more often than not, that was in the sand tap arena. Um, our amount of replication was, we had to limit the amount that we would move over. So because we have a situation where um, a workload might be either site-specific or it might be active-active, and then the other category that would, would fall into replication systems that we wanted to move across, 
but we had to prioritize our most critical systems because of the cost involved in, in trying to do everything. Uh, so we had a cutoff that said these are our most critical systems and we'll replicate those and if we, um, and then those other things we would uh, have another plan for. Um, we were a fiber channel shop and because um, we had to make a, a recover point of groupings of systems as small as possible because of the amount of runs that would be involved in, this, in being small runs, um, that would bog down our system, our ESXs, because we had to deal with a lot of runs and therefore would cause our study reservation. And uh, we really wanted to get away from all those small runs, but we were kind of tied to that with the array based replication. Next, okay. So, what did we we looked at uh, as we went forward? We uh, looked for a way to try to reduce the complexity, and uh, when we were looking at that, we saw that Zerto was software based, and we could do away with um, the use of our sand tap, and we could get rid of the recover point, and then we could manage everything within the VMware console or vCenter console. Uh, from the setup of the VMs through the uh, for the IPs, which did away with our uh, that one scripting process, um, and we could also manage the replication uh, between sites. And because we weren't array based anymore, we were just VM based. We were able to put that uh, VM on any any platform that that ESX host could access. So that gave us a lot more. Uh, simplification and, and uh, uh, flexibility. Uh, we, we had to, um, in the ray based situation, we had to take and transfer the entire one from one site to the other, whether it had data on it or not. And so there was a lot more um, storage that we shipped across the line. Uh, our ray base didn't know the difference between a one and a zero, but uh, uh, as we moved to Zerto, we were able to just move the ones that had to do with um, the VMs that we wanted to move. Uh, so we didn't move ones, I'm sorry, we moved VMDKs that we wanted to move and we didn't have to move the whole one. Uh, we choose to configure our VMs with the uh, as fat of VMDKs and so we do transfer the whole VMDK, whether it's full or not, but that's much less than the whole uh, one situation. If you do thin uh, provisioned VMDKs, then you only transfer the data that is uh, actually being used. So that's, that can be a quite a reduction there. Uh, and as I said, the simplification of uh, being, every, being able to do everything within one uh, component, uh, we no longer had to coordinate with a different group uh, that was doing our, uh, or different people that were doing our SAN versus people that were doing the color point, we could manage it all inside virtual center. So. Okay, Jennifer. All right. So those are some reasons why we bought Zerto. Uh, I've already gone through a few, but uh, the being able to re-IP the uh, the VMs within Zerto versus having to run our script, that was a good two hour savings. And we can we know where everything is at as uh, as we do it instead of having to figure that out right before we fail over. Um, well, the flexibility is that we don't have to be tied to any particular um, matched SAN system where we have the same size ones on both sides. Um, we can put it wherever there is a uh, in a uh, uh, VMFS platform or I, whatever that you, any platform that you use, it can be used uh, with ESX. Um, it was very easy to install. Uh, we installed it in about 15 minutes and we're up and going. Um, there is some thought that has to go into your rate of change and uh, how big your journal uh, sizes are ones that you're going to hold your journals on. Uh, and that is something that we found that we had to tweak over time um, because we didn't have a really good way to 
capture what exactly our rate of change was, um, even though we had some formulas and some uh, samplings that we took for weeks at you know, a week at a time. Uh, we never really could get a good handle from the VM vCenter tools that were available to us to actually see what that was. Uh, but as we got into it, we could tweak the sizes and, and adjust those accordingly. And today the journals, because they are broken up between all the different VMs, ha have their own journal, that's a lot easier to do. Um, the savings that we realized across the environment was that uh, we could make our lungs bigger. And so we had a large reduction in the number of lungs. Um, we didn't have to transfer the entire uh, lung across. We just did the v, uh, VMs themselves. And so that reduced our bandwidth requirements quite a bit. Um, the storage footprint on the target site, well, we only had to match VMs, not the white space uh, that was on the additional well, uh, where the, on the, on the lungs. And then, uh, so that in turn reduced our cost quite a bit. Across the board, we had um, a very large expense in trying to put in the sand tap and the recover point and maintaining that. Uh, both of those systems, along with our virtual center, uh, that was ultimately just reduced down to just the maintenance on the uh, Zerto product. Uh, so that, uh, that was uh, overall, we had a huge savings across the board. And Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Rich. So one of the things that you heard today highlighted um, in Rich's example was how complex the process is when you're using array-based replication and force-fitting that into a virtual environment. So we mapped this out looking at, you know, what are the steps and the interaction points between a storage team and a virtualization team. And I'm not going to highlight all these steps, but it does show the complexity of the process. So it's complex, it's manual, it's inflexible. And what that means is you don't get the full benefits of virtualization. And with Zerto, you'll see that it changes to just a few very, very simple steps. So you just need to determine if there's enough storage for the replication, allocate space, locate all the VMs affecting the, an application you're going to configure and verify your replication policies, and then that's it. Um, because Zerto is a completely virtual aware solution, it's going to be aware of all the changes made within the environment, yet your BCDR policies will not be affected. So with that, we have Zerto virtual replication, which is virtual aware. And what do I mean by that? I mean we replicate VMs and VM decays. As you heard from Rich, we don't care about LUNs or the underlying storage, and that can result in a real savings for you in terms of the amount of storage you need to use. It's software only, and this gives you two benefits. One is it, installed, it installs seamlessly into your existing infrastructure. So you've carefully planned out these complex production workloads. Now usually if it's a mission critical application, it doesn't have one or two VMs, it has several. And you've carefully planned out where exactly you want those to reside within the environment. With other BCDR solutions, such as array-based replication, you have to move things around and get all those VMs pointing to the same LUN to make sure you get that consistency. With Zerto, you don't have to change that. You can continue to architect your environment for performance and still get a very robust BCDR solution. The second is you'll see that it scales beautifully. And when I go into all the architecture, you'll see a little bit there on that. It's an enterprise class solution. It's built for your production workloads. We have a journal which is kind of like a TiVo for your environment. It provides one hour up to five days worth of historical data, giving you many, many, many points to fail back to. We have something called a virtual protection group, which I'll discuss in just a couple of slides. And that enables you to group all the VMs that are part of an application and ensure the consistent protection of those VMs. We also deliver very, very aggressive service levels, so RPOs sub 10 seconds and RTOs of minutes. And it's all automated. So you're going to see we're going to talk a lot about the data and replicating the data and grouping the data. But also, you know, you want to have full automation and orchestration of the BCDR processes. And we include that within Zerto as well. So here we have a simple architecture slide. And I say simple because here we have two sites. And with Zerto, we can protect multiple sites. 
So we have the Zerto Virtual Manager, which is a plug-in right into the vCenter server. You also have a web-based version, and you'll see that in a couple of slides as well. That's the only piece of software that you'll touch. So that's going to manage all the Zerto Virtual Replication appliances. And you can see there that there's one per ESX host. That's where you get that seamless scalability. You can replicate from anything to anything. So if you use you know, IBM, NetApp, Nimble, EMC storage, it doesn't matter. Zerto, because it lives in the hypervisor, it's completely virtual aware, doesn't care about the underlying infrastructure. We talked about it being software only and scalable. The continuous block level replication delivers very aggressive service levels. So we don't take a snapshot at a set period of time. Just as I.O. is created, we replicate the I.O. on creation. The journal, so this gives you those many, many points in time that I mentioned that you can fail back to. So for example, if you did an upgrade or experienced a logical corruption and something went wrong within the environment, you could just say you did that 4 o'clock. You could roll back the environment to 3.59 and 52 seconds and completely undo the upgrade or whatever it was that was in the environment that was disruptive. And we also include some bandwidth optimization. So we do compression and WAN optimization because although BCDR is important, we are talking about your production workloads. And we want to make sure that the bandwidth is used to execute daily operations to keep the business running. So we do have some things in there to make sure that those operations are unaffected. So here we have the virtual protection groups. So when an outage occurs, your end users don't say, I can't get into a table space. They say, I can't get into whatever the application is. I can't get into financials. I can't get into the HR software. So with Zerto, we recognize that and create something called a virtual protection group. So you can take all the VMs that are part of that application and group them together. And no matter where they are in the environment, they'll be protected exactly the same way. So this enables you to continue to use things like vMotion and storage vMotion and HA. Some of those need to be disabled when you're using a physical replication solution as the relationship between the uh, hypervisor and those VMs and the LUN is fixed. So if you move a VM to a different physical server that no longer has access to the LUN that it was tied to, you can actually break your BCDR policies and you'll be vulnerable. We also include BSS support, so there's integration with that if you want to get the application consistent checkpoints as well. So the automated failover, failback, and recovery. So this is important because, as you know, getting the data over there is half the challenge, but now the other half is making it usable. So we've completely automated the failover, failback, and recovery processes to ensure that no errors occur. So you saw that the information gets replicated over to the secondary site and something happens and you need to recover. Zerto will start to build the virtual machines on the target site. Now part of that virtual protection group that we just discussed, you're going to configure things like boot order. So the database server before the application server and then the web server last. If anything needs to be re-IP'd on the target site so you don't get those um, inconsistencies and those um, conflicts, it will re-IP those VMs automatically on the failover as well. Click to test anytime. So within Zerto, you can configure two IP addresses. One, if you need to re-IP for production failover to make sure that those, the application is available to end users. But there's also a test network that you can put in. So if you have a test network configured in your environment that has a different IP address, you simply configure that within the VPG. You can click to test any time, and Zerto will build those VMs in your bubble network, kind of isolated from the rest of your environment. And you'll be able to see exactly how long it takes to execute a DR test, and that will give you an indication of how long it's going to take you to recover. So for example, one of our customers knows it's going to take him two minutes and 43 seconds to recover his SQL application. Oh, and during the testing, replication continues. There is no interruption, you're not vulnerable or exposed, and if something were to happen in the middle of the DR test, you can stop the testing and then execute the production failover. There's also an offsite cloning feature. So for example, if you want to have an exact copy of your production environment for test or development, or perhaps you want to use, take a backup, 
the data is already at your second site. If you need to maintain backups there, just create an off-site call and take the backup off the secondary data center instead of impacting your production environment. So as I mentioned, we have the vSphere plugin. You can see it there on the left. And we also have a browser-based uh, version of our software. One of our customers uses in particular, um, his manager wanted to be able to go in and execute reports. But to get into the vSphere plugin version of Zerto, you have to have full vCenter rights. So that director could go in and start making changes and perhaps disrupt the environment, and he didn't want that to happen. So he just gave him the link to the browser-based version. He can go in there and run any report that he needs. Um, when you do the DR test, we do provide a full audit report. Perhaps he needed that to give to their regulators. So he can go in there and do anything he needs without getting into the rest of the vCenter environment. So as I did mention, we do support multiple sites. So it's a true multi-tenant infrastructure, so you can replicate from several sites to one shared infrastructure further reducing costs. We have no strict latency requirements, so you can replicate internationally, and we do bi-directional replication. So if you wanted to have, you know, have half production in site A and half the other half in site B, and then have them doing DR between them, you would be able to do that. We also have support for a single vCenter instance, so if you have a local or remote or branch office, something like that, you need to do, um, it needs to be protected. You can do disaster recovery from that site to your main data center. And of course, if you wanted to look into disaster recovery as a service, we would enable replication from your data centers to that cloud provider. So I touched on this a little bit. So the biggest report here that we get the most compliments on is the recovery reports. So once you execute a DR test, this is going to show each step within the recovery process and the time that it takes. So it's going to give you very, very detailed information on your DR processes. Auditors love this report. It meets your requirements in terms of that. And we also include some resource planning, so you can see what the consumption is on the host site and the target site, the production site and the target site. So you can see what resources are being consumed, help you do some planning for you know additional storage, processing, anything you need there. And we also have some performance charts. So we've talked a lot about private cloud disaster recovery, so that's when you, know, you have your two corporate data centers. And we touched on briefly on disaster recovery as a service. So DR as a service is a great way to evaluate your cloud service provider because you're not going to be using them uh, all the time, hopefully. This is an event that happens you know, once in a while, so you can replicate to that cloud provider and get comfortable with using them. And then as you become more and more comfortable with the cloud service provider, you can maybe give them an application that's kind of cranky. Let them host the production and the target sites and give that responsibility over to them. So I do see we have, um, oops, I, sorry, I forgot one more slide. So in closing, um, you know, we think we have a really great solution for disaster recovery in a virtual environment. You can see it's truly virtual aware Rich and his organization saw a tremendous cost savings just by moving from a physical to a virtual replication solution. It gives you application level protection. It automates the recovery process, fail over and fail back. It's built for your production workloads with those very, very aggressive service levels. And it's very, very simple to use. If you were to go to our website and take a look at some of our customer stories, you know what they are shocked about is just the simplicity of the solution. It installs in about 30 minutes, and in about an hour, you'll have VPGs configured and be replicating. So it's really, really easy to use. OK, so with that, um, sir, I'm going to take questions now, of course, but if you do think of any others, so you can email Rich or myself, one person who you didn't know was on the webinar this whole time, but Shannon Snowden, he's our senior technical marketing architect. And if we get any serious technical questions, he will be more than happy to answer those. So let me take a look at the questions. OK, so um, Rich, maybe you can talk about your personal experience with this, but Shannon, certainly feel free to jump in. 
but the question is, what type of capacity planning considerations are required with Zerto? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So we looked at, you know, what virtual machines uh, that we had uh, that we that were size specific, um, and then we looked at ones that were active, active and that left the rest of them that we wanted to uh, send across and uh, to replicate to the other site, and we knew the size of those virtual machines, how big of the MDK were. Uh, and so we could add that all up and get our total, you know, size that we needed to allocate on the other side, at the, on the other site for those to be shipped. Uh, and then we came in uh, with looking at our rate of change. Um, and we did uh, put in some uh, parameters within Virtual Center in order to capture rate of change. Uh, we did five-minute increments. Uh, for 24 hours, and we did that for seven days, and then we took our worst-case scenario. Um, that was uh, what I was referring to earlier uh, as, uh, you know, trying to figure out what size the journal sizes should be. And um, that that turned out to be somewhat of a problematic. It wasn't very exact science. So we, we did get some results, but when we started to actually implement the results, thinking that's what our rate of change was, uh, we didn't get that, so or we, we had grossly underestimated that. And that was just a matter then of, of increasing the sizes of the places that we stored our journal sizes to reflect our actual rate of change. Um, there are tools like uh, VMware VCOps, uh, uh, other tools that are out there that we, that we have uh, since looked at uh, we implemented this a few years ago, and we didn't have a tool at that time to really look at it. But um, there are tools that you can get uh, these days to actually determine what your rate of change is a lot more accurately uh, these days that can be used then to make those journal sizes. Everything is written through the journal, uh, but there is and there is ways to restrict how much how big the journal sizes are and the, and the, uh, before it's actually written to the UK uh, through a promotion process, and so um, it really, it, so ultimately the answer is it depends on, on what, how what your settings are. But starting with the rate of change is the key. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I'd like to add to that too, Jennifer. Um, this is Shannon, by the way. Um, not only uh, I know Richard when when you guys uh, did the initial implementation, you were a, an early on adopter, and the later version um, uh, of sort of the latest, what we have is um, an addition to. Uh, it's a bit more forgiving in the journal itself because it's a flexible journal. So if you need to move that journal to a data store that's for larger that's fine. We can we can do that, and then um, it will actually expand with the amount of change if it's high, and then if it starts, uh, uh, maybe it's one time a month or something, and it's very high, and then it goes down. Then the journal will actually uh, shrink as well, so it's uh, it it grows and shrinks now, and and it's uh, you're able to relocate it. Plus the um, the capacity planning. So as you're adding to your your infrastructure, because uh, what what you often see is uh, you get a f few virtual machines protected. It's very straightforward to do. It's easy to manage, and we we have customers that tell us, well, we're actually able to protect more VMs than we thought our administrative teams would handle because of the easy use. Well, that that's important for capacity planning. Once we're in place, to know. Uh, how rapid you're growing, and uh, for you know either new storage or new resource acquisition planning, and that's those reports that Jennifer was showing you. That um, uh, there's one of them in there that's got a very detailed capacity uh, planning report that gives you the source side and the target side detailed usage of, of both sides. So, uh, Jen, are you uh, you back on uh, audio? 
Yes, I am. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, a couple questions on um, will this presentation be available? And yes, we are recording the presentation. It will be posted on our website. Um, that usually takes about a week or so. So you should see it probably early next week sometime. Um, so here is another question. So is there a way to edit the VM settings, such as the number of CPUs and the amount of RAM, once the VPG has been failed over to the DR site with a script? Will this feature be available natively in Zerto on native release on future releases? I can I can take that one. Uh, I don't know, Richard. Do you okay. have any that you're doing that way? I'll give you the opportunity first. Oh no, go ahead. Okay. So basically, it's a resizing at the target site because maybe you're just wanting it to be alive, and the and the functionality is secondary. So you may want to reduce the number of CPUs and RAM. Uh, in the failover workflow, we do have a, 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 the capability of running a, a script, and it could be a PowerShell script at the end of it, that uh, once the machine's up and alive, then you could change the settings and have the script execute all the changes that uh, if you want to change RAM, CPU, all that could be done, um, set up in the workflow, and you could do a non-disruptive testing of the, those changes as well. And you can actually do an off-site clone and make sure that everything's working on a clone of the exact op uh, operation you're trying to do before you put it into production so you'll know your RTOs and you'll know the actual failover works. Okay, great. So someone is wondering about um, an example of your our largest customer. So um, I don't know about our largest customer, but I can tell you about our largest customer that's publicly available. <laughs> And we had a uh, press release done with uh, Premier Healthcare in February, and that's up on our website. And I think they've implemented 300 VMs so far on their way to 600 VMs. So that's what's publicly available at this time. I know that person's probably looking for a different answer, but that's what we have. And, and um, this is this. We, we currently do about uh, 200 uh, that we replicate. Okay, okay great. And I think Jennifer, you're saying it uh, carefully. Um, yes. <laughs> we, we, we support uh, 500 VMs per VRA and uh, 5,000 per vCenter. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the scalability of the product that we're comfortable with saying numbers. Um, yeah. We do have just a lot of customers that don't want to divulge bigger numbers, but they're certainly there. Um, and then, so Shannon, on the answer you just gave, are those realistic tested or theoretical? Uh, our QA says that um, those are realistic. Yeah, so they have an environment um, that they've scaled to ensure that we're able to uh, protect those numbers that Shannon just mentioned. Uh, so here is a question that I can actually answer. Um, what is the minimum bandwidth required by Zerto? Um, so it's five uh, megabits per second is the minimum bandwidth required. Um, we do have a customer who's using uh, a little less than that, but if there were to be an issue, we'd unfortunately have to say that's not supported. So it's uh, five meg is the minimum for our bandwidth. And we that customer, by the way, who has that um, right around five meg, he's seeing a five second RPO. So he's still getting very, very good performance. Um, Shannon, here's a question for you. Uh, I, well, I would add one thing about. Oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, right. I, I would add one thing about uh, bandwidth. Um, we have a we have a large pipe, uh, and uh, we do about 60 terabytes uh, in in between the two sites with the 200 VMs that we have. Um, and what I would say about the well, you know, bandwidth is on the other end of the spectrum is that Zerto will open up multiple uh, TCP/IP channels of seven, uh, up to seven meg each, and can manage the packets through all those channels and realign them on the other side. Uh, but it it will use uh, the bandwidth that you give it. So um, 
you want to be just uh, if you have voice or something going across that same pipe, you want to make sure that you QoS um, the voice for sure, and then uh, maybe read the rest. There's different ways you can do it. You can read the rest for Zerpho, or you can QoS the amount of pipe that you want to use for Zerpho. So it will use it, uh, and it'll move a lot of data quickly if you open it up. So, but but there are ways to limit the uh, amount that you're using the cloud. So. Okay, great. And then I think I missed a question. There was one I thought I saw on Microsoft. Well, maybe not. Okay. So uh, can you have protection groups that span vCenter instances? For example, an application spans m more than one vCenter for HA purposes. That's for me, probably. I, I think, think so, Shannon. Want, Sorry. Yeah, uh, I say that's from Mike. Mike, I think what we do want to do is follow up just to get your specific use case on that, because um, our virtual protection groups are are uh, related to a vCenter, and uh, what I want to make sure of in a in a follow up is the actual deployment that you're talking about, because uh, I don't want to give you the false impression here that of something that we do or don't do. Okay, sounds fair enough, and I did find that question that I missed. Um, Shay, I think this is one for you, too. Um, how about MSCS, so Microsoft Cluster Support Virtual Machines? Yeah, so anything with a shared disk, we're not going to support, but uh, active-passive clusters we certainly do support. So What we find are a lot of times because of the resiliency that you're trying to get in a in, in a clustered solution, if it's not for capacity, then because you're within seconds of being able to fail the thing over with short RTOs, that suffices for uh, what you were trying to accomplish in the cluster to begin with. Okay, great. So I guess while I, I'll give it another minute or so, see if any other questions come in. We have answered all of them so far. But the only thing I just want to add is you know, we're more than happy to do a trial. We'd love for you to trial the software um, and see how easy it is to use one of the most, I run the customer reference program. That's how I can get in touch with people like Rich to present with me. Um, but one of the most common comments that I get is, your product does what you say it's going to do in your marketing materials. And it's, I feel kind of bad that so many of you have been sold things that don't do what they say in the marketing materials. But, you know, our product backs it up. So I would love to have you trial it. You know, certainly we'll have someone follow up with you if that's what you're interested in. But it's a very quick installation, quick and painless, and really, really easy to use. Okay, Ooh, another question. Um, while you do some WAN optimization, do you partner with any WAN optimization products? So we don't partner with anyone specifically, although you know we have done joint initiatives. Um, for example, we have a case study uh, with uh, Silver Peak, where the customer uses Zerto with Silver Peak. So, because we do our WAN optimization and compression, as you can imagine, just on the Zerto replicated data, we don't do it for anything else in the environment, just because it's not within our our you know area, our purview. We can't see that. So, a product like Silver Peak or a Riverbed would be able to see all of the traffic within the environment and give you optimization across everything. So we do um, have t uh, many customers who are using products. You know, I can think of one off the top of my head, and I'll be happy to send you that case study where they're using Silver Peak and Zerto, and they love it. Shannon, I don't know if you have anything else to add. I think you nailed it. I mean, the uh, use case for each are, are valid, and um, we're there for to give you choice. I think that's a good thing. Uh, if you want to use yours, fine. If not. You check our box and we see about a 50% average bandwidth savings. Sometimes you see higher, sometimes you see lower, depending on the profile of what's being replicated. Yeah, one thing we don't recommend is to use both. Don't use our compression and then their compression. Oh, um, Shannon, I think this was one for you. Unless, are you using offsite clone search at your site? Have you used the offsite clone feature? Oh. 
Okay, so Shannon, oh, he said it's hard to hear, Rich. So Shannon, why don't you take this one just for audio purposes. Um, can you please provide a bit more insight into how we leverage Zerto to perform backups in our DR site? Well, what you could do is um, with the Zerto offsite clone feature, uh, it essentially uses whatever point in time you want to restore back to. So in the point in time, of course, you can go back to five days. Pick a point in time that you want to spin off uh, an offsite clone at the recovery site of the entire virtual protection group. Well, once that happens, then you're able to, I know we have some customers that actually use uh, the restore to a, to a volume, to a data store that they're able to do the dedupe and backup and everything at, at that point. Um, so think of it as we automate standing up that parallel environment and then you can leverage any kind of backup solution you, you, you would normally use from there because they're freestanding real virtual machines. If there is such a thing as a real virtual machine. <laughs> All right, as soon as I always say, I think that's our last question to come flying in, so I hate to say that. But I do think that was our, oh, see. Um, so would you be able to leverage array-based backups using VADP? Or maybe that's a type in the DR site. Yeah, so think of it as um, you would use you would use a Zerto virtual replication to um, stand up the VMs and then whatever backup solution you would typically use, you can use. Um, we, we, um, there's a distinct difference between what the, you know, a standard backup product would do and, and, and what we're doing. Yeah, you're in the DR site. So that is the offsite clone feature. Uh, I saw Mike had a follow-up to the question there. It is yeah. at the, what we spin up is at the, at the recovery site because We've already replicated the data to the recovery site, and the VMs are there, so it makes sense just to clone it from there. And if you do a backup at that site, then you've done two things. You have not only have your backup, but it's actually at the uh, remote site. I would, uh, this is Rich again. I would, I would say, too, that uh, to piggyback on that, but um, you know, there's a feature within Zerto that allows you to precede uh, disks. Uh, so if you have a VMDK that is restored to your remote site, uh, and back, it's a backup of one that is at the uh, production site, you can precede the two disks. You can say, I want to point to that backup disk, and instead of transferring all the data across, I just want to do a a block check on each block of that and only ship the things that are going to change. So if you have a lot of storage that you want to replicate, you don't have to put it all over the across the, uh, your land. You can precede that data with the uh, restoring backups, connect to the VMs to those VMDKs, and it'll catch up of, uh, only shipping the data that's different. So that's, that's a good use of uh, using a a uh, backup that you have for a VM to get started with uh, the search up. Yeah, and we actually had a um, we actually had a blogger um, post a blog uh, doing that very thing, uh, uh, Rich, where they used a backup product to manually you know transport the data over to the recovery site, and then dump the VMDKs to data stores and then use the Zerto pre-seed feature to do what you're talking about. Just map it to the VMDKs, the recovery site. Then we just do a delta sync. And uh, he was able to, able to uh, accomplish getting a large amount of data uh, protected very quickly that way. And that's really the way we see it in production as well. If you're uh, for not in cloud providers, but for enterprises and such that uh, they, they have a large amount of data to to either migrate or to, to protect, then they'll they'll have some sort of NAS or tape backup that they'll use, uh, put the VMDKs to the remote site, and then do what we call a, uh, the preceding, which just maps to the VMDKs and does a delta sync. OK, 
Okay, we do have another question. Um, Shannon, I think it's for you. It says, has Zerto impacted the number of clients that have decided to internalize their BCDR requirements instead of using BCDR hot site vendors? I wonder, do, I guess they mean active, active? Well, I think, um, uh, trying to define what this is, it could possibly be um, a bi-directional question to okay. where it's, um, they're using the, the uh, a hot site or a hosted site vendor or their own internal um, for, for some of the systems and then doing essentially reverse DR back to their, um, to their own site. Um, I'm looking at the question again here. Yeah, so I think that's a, maybe a question of simplicity too, of mm. the deployment's quick. The um, and, and as Richard talked about, it, it's it's quick and it's uh, very uh, easy to understand what's going on. Particularly if you're a, if you're a VMware administrator, it's going to feel very native to you uh, because that's how we designed it. Um, the steps are easy, and you're you're getting your data uh, replicated quickly to the point that needing um, a vendor or uh, professional services is just it's really not necessary. So maybe that's where you're saying about that question too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then here's a scenario actually that, uh, Shannon, we're starting to see more and more with the, some of the cloud service providers that they work with. But, um, you know, so the question is what if you are a cloud provider, a customer and wants to put their systems in your cloud as the primary data center but leverage zero to replicate back to their DR site. So we do see some of our cloud providers um, offering that service, that type of service. Yeah, they call it reverse Shannon, DR. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead, Shannon. I know you speak to more of the cloud service providers than I do. Yeah, it's just reverse DR. Uh, so yeah, Mike, it's uh, um, they want to use the power at the service provider. They get the latest, greatest equipment. And then they use their maybe a slightly older equipment that's still in good shape, or you know, they still lease it or whatever. Um, and they don't want to do a hardware refresh, and they can eventually look at either phasing it out or do some sort of a hybrid solution. So you have the the power at the uh, at the hosted site, and then you use your own internal data center as the recovery site. Yeah, certainly, because the nature of Zerto is. Uh, it's bi-directional, and uh, we can you, know, you compare two sites or ten sites. It really doesn't matter, and then you set up the replication, whatever direction you want. So certainly, that's a that's a, a configuration that we do have providers selling them as a solution. Yes, uh, so, sorry, I should ask the question first. I guess uh, this was just yeah. another follow-up to that one, Jen. It was uh, so a single Zerto setup can support multiple different destinations. Uh, exactly. So I'll, I'll take you to the service provider side for a second. They use a common Zerto infrastructure that Jennifer, you know, showed you in the slides, and we're multi-tenant native. So it doesn't matter how many sites or how many tenants. The same back-end Zerto virtual manager and the replication uh, of, of uh, VRAs will be able to support multi-tenant deployments. And that's the reason why you see such an embrace of Zerto with uh, service providers. Mm -hmm. And then here's another question. I can actually answer this one. So can we leverage Zerto to have customers migrate to our cloud? Yes, you can. And actually, if you look on our website, there's a quote from Fujitsu right now where they did exactly that. And, you know, they were looking at, you know, perhaps a forklift kind of migration versus just having, you know, setting up Zerto, you set up the replication, it gets all synced up, and then you just do a zero, we have a zero data loss move feature. Um, so we have many, many customers who have used it for that as well, and it is more of the secondary benefit. The primary use case, of course, that we focus on is disaster recovery, but when you get this kind of flexibility with the ability to move information kind of everywhere, I kind of call it the illities, you get flexibility, agility, all these things, so. Now that we, oh, go ahead, Shannon. I was just going to ask Richard, do you guys do a, uh, 
in the disaster avoidance, do you do a move operation or do you just do a live failover? So uh, we have uh, two scenarios that we would operate under. Uh, one is uh, because we do a proactive migration and use the move function. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, brings everything down on one side and brings it up on the other side uh, ready to go. Um, the, well, we are uh, cognizant that we could have a fire in our building or something to have a catastrophic failure in our data center. And, and at that point, we would uh, be prepared to do a failover, which would go to the other side and actually bring all our VMs up that were running at the um, production site in the uh, migrated uh, in the uh, PR site by pulling them over and getting them started that way. So um, we have never had to do that, and hopefully we won't ever, but uh, we do plan for that scenario. Okay, great. So we are just about at the top of the hour. So thank you so much for joining, everyone. Great, great question. So that's why I always like having a customer on. We get so many uh, more really interesting questions. So thank you all for your time today. Our emails are right up there if you want to follow up with us directly if we didn't get to your question today, although I do think we got to all of them. But if we didn't, certainly feel free to send us an email. And thank you so much for your time today. Rich, thank you for your time. You can see all the questions, 30 minutes of questions. Uh, you're welcome, Jennifer. Thanks. So thank you. And thanks, Shannon. I'm not techie ones, the ones that get too hard for me. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks.